Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining our webinar, the first of the year. It's, uh, it's always a pleasure to have our community joining our events and uh, your feedback and uh, making sure that uh, we are always providing something that is useful for you. Um, today, our session is about uh, meetings and you can see there it's not about the tools, the facilitation, effective uh, meeting, uh, and especially in a remote uh, in a remote setup. Our star of the day is Sue Johnston. She is one of the uh, best facilitators I have met out there. Uh, a great communicator and um, uh, a big name in our agile community. So I am very happy to have Sue today as our uh, uh, speaker. So just quickly, uh, what's going on today? So uh, welcome uh, from the Toronto Agile community. My name is Ardita Karai. With me is Peter Jakes, my my very uh, friendly, helpful volunteer. Uh, also another volunteer in uh, in these events is also uh, Paul Henman, uh, and he's attending as well. So it is not just uh, just me here. Uh, we're going to go through uh, present uh, introducing Sue, and then presentation will uh, follow up with the questions. Actually, there's going to be questions during uh, uh, the session. We welcome your questions during the session. Uh, please use the question um, uh, box there to communicate with us, and then. Um, uh, some uh, closing and thank yous and upcoming events. Um, everyone is on mute to avoid any uh, external noises. Um, and if you have any technical issue, please um, uh, try to see if you can use another browser or log on, log off. Um, we cannot do events like these or any other uh, event that we do without the help of our sponsors. It is always a pleasure to have our sponsors um, helping us and uh, be supporting our activities and our events. Uh, so these are our sponsors that uh, we always want to thank and, um, and, and for their support and for their help. Our speaker for today, as I said, is Sue, Sue Johnston. And Sue is, um, as she says, her tagline, Sue helps you talk to, so people listen. Um, I know Sue as a friend, and um, I always enjoy her company, and I always enjoy the questions that she brings in our conversations. And, and it's always making you think about, hey, what if I communicate it in a different way? What if I think uh, from a different point of view? Uh, her book, Talk to Me, is a great book. Uh, little book that helps a lot uh, is, um, uh, is a story that any one of us can be um, into that position and go through those uh, situations and uh, helps everyone. If you haven't uh, read it, I, uh, I suggest you do. So without further ado, I want to present to you and I want to leave this stage to Sue. Thank you. <laughs> So much, Ardita. That's uh, really a pretty nice introduction. It's always a pleasure to work with um, with you and uh, the Agile community in Toronto. I am seeing a thing that says "Show my screen." Should I do that? Yep. Yep. Okay. Of course. <laughs> <There> we <go. laughs> There we go. All right. One of the things we're going to talk about today is like always make sure you understand the technology. Anyway, uh, let's get started. I'm looking forward to the next sort of 55 minutes or so where we can kind of play with the idea that it's not really about the tools. In the work that I do as an, as an agile coach and a trainer of coaches and facilitators, I often hear this lovely excuse that you can probably imagine. Um, oh, we can't do that because we have remote teams. And, um, and they won't let us use 
you know, whatever tool it is that, that people recommend or want. Um, one of the things we're going to talk about um, here is how to do how to do a really effective meeting where people are really engaged when you don't have the deluxe tools. I mean, some people have a really great opportunity. We've got IOBEA and they've got Mural and maybe Adobe Connect where they have a live, always open camera to the remote thing, but we don't all have that. Sometimes the best that we have is just audio or maybe on a good day Zoom. So it's not so much the tool that you have, but what you do with it. That's going to be the topic we're going to talk about today. So Ardita gave me a beautiful introduction. Uh, the parts that are really sort of relevant for this particular program are that um, I was a teleworking pioneer way back in the 1990s when Bank of Montreal was just starting that. And so we didn't even have the internet at that time. And my group was working almost exclusively a work from home group. So there were things that we did to stay connected and to have our meetings effective. So a little bit of learning there. I did my master's at Royal Rose University when I was living in Bermuda in the middle of nowhere and um, was able to do that totally online. So again, uh, we didn't have dial up there. I mean, we were still on dial up there for most of my two years, two years. So again, we had sort of very low fidelity um, ways of communicating and holding our meetings. Um, and then uh, I've been doing online training either for a big coach school or my own programs since uh, about uh, 2004. So I've got a bit of experience with the sort of struggle that we have to, to make sense out of getting connected with people over distance. The big deal, the big idea is that it's really the conversation that matters. Um, whether you have the deluxe tool or you have, you know, at best a telephone, the it's the conversation that matters. And that's kind of the, the, the theme that has shaped my work uh, throughout my entire many years of working. So the way this discussion is going to go today, um, I'll do pretty much all the talking because that's the way this tool works. Um, and uh, But we'll, we'll look at sort of the introduction, we'll look at planning, how to engage people, some skills that you'll want to develop and then we'll wrap it up. I think we'll have time for questions. I know that our data will be collecting those as we go. So we have a tool here, uh, go to webinar and we're available. Uh, what's available for us is a, is a poll. So we've set up a poll to have you share with us what type of meetings you attend or run remotely. And of course we're limited to five five questions. So there's one of the constraints that we have with this tool. Anyway, I'd love to see how there's the poll. It's opening. And we'll give you a few seconds to get in there. And maybe Ardita, you can tell me when we have enough answers and what they are because I don't see those. I see 40% of people voted. So I'm going to leave a little bit more time to get a higher percentage. Yeah. Six. I think everyone can vote on this. <laughs> <laughs> well, an easy question. I all of the above, but I had to take it off when I found out I only had five. Uh, okay. So we're reaching the peak here. It's about 80, 80 votes. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to close it. And at this point. Uh, do you see? Okay, share the results. Here are the results. <laughs> Where do they show up? <laughs> oh, you don't? Oh, okay. I don't see that. You can read them. Okay. What's our big winner? It is the daily stand up. So the it, daily stand up is 79%. Sprint planning is 66%. Sprint reviews and demos is 59%. Retrospectives are 50%. And training sessions is 55%. Can you hear me? No. No, you cannot hear me. I can hear you. Um, okay. We have we have a new poll now. 
know the, the results. And I'm, do you want me to start the new poll? Yeah. Okay. So the second poll, it's going to be which, which of the issues? Yeah. Which is the most challenging issue you face in these yep. virtual? Yeah. We're getting some votes coming up. Okay, we are 56%. Let's go. A little more. <laughs> okay. We're about 83. 84. All right. I'm going to close right now. 86. Yeah. And sharing. Do you see the results? I don't, but it's the important um, part is does the audience. <laughs> so unequal participation is 82%. Wow. Okay. Uh, conversation wonders is 52%. Okay. And um, same discussion over and over is 28%. All right. People arriving so late and meetings that's... going too long is 57%. Yeah. And technology confusion, confusion is 47%. I think I fall on that too. Uh, yes. <laughs> okay, there we go. <laughs> so. And the interesting aspect of this is that sometimes, even when we do have a tool, we it's it's clunky or cumbersome or limited. So um, the the idea of of the content being the part that's really important is is really super super valuable for us to know. Now the the dream that we have, which is also our job, is that when we're running a meeting, either as a uh, the facilitator or maybe as a as a participant who couldn't be working as a secondary facilitator is that we're trying to create a container where people can make good decisions. That's kind of our job um, because the whole point of having the meeting is for us to, um, to be able to make a decision and move ahead uh, with the work. So I have created over the years uh, something that I call the facilitation arc. And it's a kind of process, it's as close as we can come to a step-by-step -step process for organizing a meeting. Anytime we're dealing with human beings, it's pretty hard to make it step-by-steppy. But um, this kind of works and it's proven over with lots of people who use this kind of model. Um, and it's it it it's we require the same kind of uh, attention and planning and care in a virtual meeting as we do with one where we've got a lot of people coming in to meet face to face. What I hear a lot is, oh, I'm just about to jump on a, jump on a call for a meeting. And it feels very unplanned. And that's a little bit why we get those answers like the meeting wanders or there's unequal participation or um, you know, that goes on too long. So the, plan, the the steps that, as I see them, we have to plan. There's absolutely no way we can avoid it. Um, some of us don't love that, some of us do. Then there's a stage, there's a situation where we set the stage. What we're trying to do is make people welcome. We'll talk about all of these stages as we, as we work through the 55 minutes, but we set the stage first so that people know kind of why they're there and what they're up to. And then we come to uh, uh, gathering the data. What the heck are we talking about? What is the problem? What are we trying to do here? Things like that. And we need to think about those things, develop some insight around them using the information and the data that we have. Then we have to make a decision. And um, then we need to close the meeting. And so we'll walk through these steps as we go. Let's start with planning. So the whole purpose of the meeting is to get something done. So we have to be able to establish that for ourselves and for the people that we're inviting to participate. You need to be really, really clear. And what I'd love to say first is if you are having a status meeting, don't have it. 
because status can be revealed in so many other ways. It's in your board. It could be pushed in an email. If you're wasting time telling people what you're up to, um, then that's kind of not the way you're supposed to be. So if we think about the step, the uh, the stand up in the in the daily stand up uh, as a status meeting that's kind of mm. but if we think about the daily stand up as a synchronization meeting we're trying to figure out who's got to do what what when and how do i need help and who's you know what's going to land here and what's going to land there and where are the problems it's a much more meaningful um, meaningful meeting so it's just kind of like yesterday i did this today i'm going to do this tomorrow i'm going to do this i got no blockers don't have that meeting, have one that really communicates. Um, so that's kind of one start. With a stand-up meeting, some of this process may not apply, uh, but certainly for every other kind of meeting that we have, it does, and to some degree, this it will apply to stand-up as well. So sometimes we're having a meeting to explore ideas, sometimes we're having a meeting to make a decision, share info, sometimes it's a training session like this, this one, learn something new. Sometimes we're just trying to get to know each other. It could be a lift off or a team, um, a team goal setting, or you may be, you know, doing your sprint planning. Uh, and it could be something else, like relevant relative to a pro problem, or it might be the retrospective. Either way, we got to know what we're trying to achieve before we set out to have the meeting. Um, you might also want separate meetings between. Um, if we go back to this, the area of of uh, gathering the data and making the decision uh, sometimes get conflated and people rush to make a decision before they've actually thought about what they've got or have all the information or even have kind of done any analysis. So sometimes you might have your gathering data part in the morning and then have your deciding in the afternoon or have it the next day. Um, that's just one strategy that I've learned over the years. So we also have to figure out who needs to be at this meeting. Sometimes uh, the reason some people don't participate or over participate or participate in unhelpful ways is that they shouldn't even be at that meeting. So it's important for us to figure out who we need there and what we want them to do once they get there. And I made this four box matrix uh, around the the dichotomy of being interested or disinterested or having info that's valuable or not. And so if we think about the first lot, the low lows, don't invite them. They're not going to enjoy it and they're not going to add anything. But sometimes they go because it's Wednesday and we have to because our name is on the list. So really think about, uh, you know, what does somebody bring to the meeting before you invite them? The next one, key group. They want to be there. So the people with a lot to lot to add and people who are interested, you you probably don't have to work too hard to get them there. The next group is the one that you've got to be sort of crafty with because they've got some value to add to this meeting. They're probably super, super busy. They're already double booked. You want to give them some really good reason why they need to be there. And over the years, I've learned to say things like, if you want us to be able to support you in the whatever is their key thing, then it would be really, really valuable to have you here so that you can guide us because your, your input was, is going to be helping us shape what you're ultimately going to get. Give them a bit of what's in it for me, um, and then maybe your meeting will look more important than the 13 other ones that they're invited to that day. The last group, our favorites, are the ones who are interested, but they have nothing to add. And sometimes they will just be there because they don't trust you and they want to make sure it doesn't go off the rails or they want to remind you that back in 1938, we did this and it didn't work. Um, they can distract and derail. Um, they have a high interest but they don't really bring anything. And so my suggestion is if we can find some other way to keep these people informed. So you can either say, well, we don't really need you there because we respect your time, but we need you, you know, we'll send you some information about it or we'll help you, you know, we'll let you know our decisions. Sometimes it's hard. They may be the vice president of no, and you, you know, have to have them there. But in most cases, if you've got some other way of, of keeping them informed or keeping them involved, they don't need to be at your meeting and they will <laughs> probably appreciate that. I don't know. <laughs> so 
Um, someone is asking, um, how can I tell which quadrant someone falls into? <laughs> Watch them in the meeting. <laughs> okay, so the one, the 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 ones that are the in this group, these these folks here. Um, are, are the hardest to get and probably the most important. So those are the ones like, if you were in the meeting and they aren't there and you're hearing say, gee, it's too bad that Joe Bloggs isn't here, right? Um, that's the that's the guy, the guy that you want. You wanna get Joe invited. You know, this person is probably, you know, you know who that is and, and they have a high interest, but uh, you really want to kind of do a, what we used to call a stakeholder analysis on like who is really impacted by this and who has information for us. So this is really, you know, you want you want the people who are going to be impacted, who who have a say um, and are super interested and you want to have have, you know, have their have their views. But these guys here. If you generally know because they derail or they just sit there and don't say anything, or sometimes they sit there and they suck their teeth and roll their eyes. Seen that any? Usually you can tell by the behavior. Does that help? We can move on. Yes. We got we to got to um, also be thinking about what questions will help us reach the goal. So if we were thinking about a meeting um, where we're trying to decide, let's say it's a retrospective, uh, for example, and we're trying to decide how we did and what we can improve, um, as a facilitator or even as a, a participant, you might want to be thinking about questions that would help us reach that goal. You're wanting to have some things in your plan that you know what you're going to ask so that it's not just, oh, well, here we all are, What's who's got what to say. You want to be able, as a facilitator or as a secondary facilitator, if your facilitator isn't doing it, um, to ask the question that will guide us to the, the gathering the right data and having the right approach to looking at it. And then you'll also probably want to be thinking about what activities might do it. Sitting around on a phone for an hour and a half is not always our idea of a good time. I try when I'm doing this to give people things to do. For example, make a list. And it can even just be a list that they're making, um, you know, with paper on their desk. Or, you know, throw some stickies on your wall and then take a picture of it and send it to me by an email. Or, you know, if we do have something like Zoom where there is a picture, then they can just kind of, they can wave them at you or they can show things. But you really want to figure out some way to give them something to do so that they're not checking Facebook or, you know, Slack or getting ready for their next meeting. Um, so in, in some of our situations, we have things like today, we have polls, but you know, just telling people to write something down if it's important. You may also have given them something to read in advance. Um, if you've got someone to help you, you can have somebody capturing uh, what people say on a whiteboard or on stickies and then take a photograph and share it with everybody. Um, you gotta be, you gotta be creative to get around some of these, of these obstacles, but it can be done. And you need a plan B because all of the stuff you plan sometimes goes out the window, which is why it's really good to have a, a pair, you know, to, to do some pair facilitation or have somebody like we do um, with Peter, you know, ready to move the slides if we can't. So we got to set the stage. This is where we want to be able to help people feel comfortable when they get to the meeting. So we're trying to create some safety for them, some psychological safety and trust. And we want to figure out ways to help them get connected. So if I'm if I'm doing a a meeting face to face, or you are, sometimes we'll have posters up in the room, we'll have a big sign that says, you know, welcome to get Kanban or something like that. You'll maybe want to have that if you can somehow in the any documentation or slides that you're using or any pre pre meeting stuff you send out um i remember a a big cross functional project i was on at bank of montreal years ago and for reasons that are not relevant to this our our mascot was actually a picture of a duck and so all of our pre meeting stuff always had this little cartoon duck on it and it was just a little way of sort of welcoming us and showing showing us that we were all part of the same tribe. So setting the stage, lots of ways to do it. We'll look at some now. 
Um, so using the question feature, I would invite you to share something that would contribute to making people feel more comfortable and productive at a meeting of, that you're thinking about. So I would suggest if you're working in an Agile team, let's think about a retrospective uh, as the meeting that we're thinking about and, and then use the question feature just those of you who've got an idea, what might be some things that would contribute to people feeling comfortable at this meeting? Mm, our data can. can yeah. You... <laughs> um, so you can read them as they come in, or the ones that interest you. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, um, do you want me to bring some of the questions that people are bringing here on this? Sure. Yeah, have we got a lot of those. So yeah, um, people usually say, oh, sorry, we were multitasking. Can you please repeat? How do we handle these people? Don't repeat. <laughs> Don't repeat. They can pay attention. We'll talk a little bit about that a, a little bit later, but yeah, okay. they repeat. And people coming late, don't give them the benefit. Don't give them the benefit of coming up to speed. <laughs> That's an old, old facilitator technique because you just encourage them. Okay, some other questions that are coming up are, how are you feeling right now? Oh, that's a good one. Doing that's your best to add a video feed. Uh, getting some very simple form of verbal input from every attendee. Yeah, every yeah one of the things to do, let's check everybody's mic, and then you can make sure that everybody's there and not just locked in and um, visiting mm -hmm. their dog. Encourage truthfulness. Mm. <laughs> my, my coach question would be, mm, let's say more about that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, asking for their contribution. Yeah. So some good uh, ideas are coming in. Let's keep them going. Yeah. Uh, give people a, ro a role in the meeting. Know that lets them know what they need to do. Yeah. Um, check in. Yeah. Agenda ahead of time. Yeah. Start with highlights of the sprint. What if your boss ask? What if your boss asks you to repeat? <laughs> <laughs> We're going back to the repeat. <laughs> oh my gosh! Well, maybe you will call it in the moment. <laughs> You'll use the best judgment. So, so these are great ideas that have coming in. I've I've put some together that are the ones that I like to use. You want to show people what's in it for them. Um, and why they should participate. Um, and that starts with the invitation to the meeting. So rather than just booking them in through um, Outlook or however you use book, booking in your organization, send them some kind of information that lets them know, this is why I need you here. This is what I'd love you to prepare. This is what I expect you to share. And you'll say it in a more professional way than this is what I want. But you know, your, your input is gonna be valuable because blah, blah, blah. And then they know what it is they're, they need to prepare and are more likely than to come prepared for your meeting. So you, you wanna have that right there in the invitation, making them understand why they're there. They wanna know why they're meet, why the meeting is happening, what's expected from them, who else is coming maybe. Um, and someone mentioned earlier uh, in the chat, the agenda. You also may need to tell people uh, or give them a, um, a, a even a bit of a, a working session or a quick reference guide on how the tech works. I I did some advanced coaching courses last year at a university and our, our weekly calls were one hour and the first 20 minutes of every call was spent wasted as far as I was concerned, trying to get people hooked up and figuring out how the, the technology works. So it's it's one of those things that it can be a real showstopper and you need to back up for your tech if you've got it. And then another thing people wanna know is what happens to our output. Really important, if I'm gonna invest an hour with you in this, I wanna know where, what we decide is gonna go and how it's gonna affect my work and my organization and maybe my career. Um, you also want to put up a parking lot, just like we do in regular meetings uh, when we're face to face. Sorry to to, uh, to to interrupt. Are you on the same stage? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. I'm on a sorry. Different, I'm on a different my, slide. My bad. My bad. You're, You're right. never bad, Ardita. <laughs> <laughs> just one slide behind. 
yeah, sorry. <laughs> okay. So uh, we want, the big deal is that we're trying to make people comfortable. We're trying to, to help people feel that they do want to participate. So that idea of, you know, let's be truthful that somebody put in there in the, as a question, you know, yeah, like let's, let's remove for a moment our our silo hats you know yeah we're from marketing or yeah we're from it or hr or wherever but let's just like really look at what we need to achieve here and you may need to say a little bit of that uh, at the beginning of the meeting because we do have some sometimes inter inter intra corp, corporate rivalries or you know com committee communities that are not getting along with each other particularly well and you know let's just what we're trying to resolve this let's see what's the best we can do um, so then we're moving into the actual meeting this is where the participants do most of the work um, you are holding a process to keep them on track and so um, when we look at these three elements gather data is sort of like what and then developing insights is kind of like so what and then deciding is what are we going to do next? And this, uh, those three things come from a very interesting book called Making Questions Work by Dorothy Strachan. And, and I've got in my last slide a, a reference to that. Um, something really important to, to do, to think about is don't get to deciding too soon. It's absolutely critical that you think about stuff before you make the decision because what will happen then, and Ardita, you've probably seen this, um, what happens when we when we make a decision prematurely and we haven't looked at all the implications. We make the wrong decision. We make the wrong decision. Yeah, we might do a really good job just, of building the wrong just, thing. Yeah, just like so. what we did a minute ago. I didn't think <laughs> very well and I made the wrong decision. <laughs> yeah, so we want to be careful that we don't get there too soon. So as a facilitator, one of the things you may want to do, you know, because you will see people wanting to creep into solutioning. It's it just going to happen because that's how the human brain works when it sees a problem. You're going to say, we'll talk to solutions to solutions later. Right now, we're looking at what are the facts? What are, the, what are the impacts of these facts on this particular situation? So sometimes you have to be a bit of a, of a let's say, a, um, a border collie and, you know, herd people in, in the right direction and not let them escape the boundaries um, because, because it's really important to keep them on track. That's, that's your whole, your whole job there. So uh, another very familiar uh, facilitation model talks about diverge and converge and so basically when we're creating the ideas we're we're collecting the ideas we're we're talking in that what space that's when we diverge and we're moving into a lot of ideas this place is quite often called the grown zone because this is hard we're looking at what did we just dig up what's the information we have and and what does it mean for us? And there may be lots of different meanings and implications. And so this is the hard part of the meeting. Um, this part is usually easy if you've done this well. So uh, when we come to, the, to, to choosing the ideas, that's when we decide what's next. And that's kind of known as converge. And so that's another model that you may see if you read books on facilitation. And the really important thing, of course, is to have a time box. Um, make sure that you you do limit each of these stages and and how much you'll need you'll only be able to tell through experience um, and you may you know you may find that it takes the whole meeting just to look at the material when you think that you're going to be all settled and sewn up by the end of, of an hour doesn't usually happen so that's why it's sometimes useful to to have two meetings one to create and evaluate one to choose or even three So think about a meeting that you have frequently and grab some sticky notes, or it could be a list or a piece of paper or whatever, um, or count on your fingers. And just write one idea per sticky, capturing some ideas you might use for gathering information. This is my way of trying to get you engaged through a tool that doesn't really increase in, encourage engagement. So I'll give you a minute or two to do that. So while uh, people are probably, um, they're probably going to write down those ideas. Uh, we have a quick question from Chris is saying that this is a great insight into meetings in general. Uh, when is the remoteness going to be addressed further? The remoteness is the whole problem. Like this is the issue. Um, 
the remoteness is you've got to keep people busy. You've got to keep people engaged. You've got to keep people doing things and you've got to figure out how to, to keep them talking. We're, we're going to get a little bit to that when we come, when we come to um, the decision-making, but, but what I, my point is that there is no difference between a remote meeting and an in-person one. You have to be really, really super creative uh, to, to recreate that, the, um, the connection between people that you do have. I mean, it's always more valuable if they know each other. Um, but, you know, we see it. I, I run 12 week courses of coaches from all over the world. And by week three, they're really bonded. And it's, it's because they've been talking to each other and they've also had offline ways of communicating. So I would say, you know, if it's only a phone call, you may want to look at some sort of Slack channel or some asynchronous chat that, you know, lets people get to know each other. Is that helpful? But the, the big point is it's not about the tools and the distance is about engaged people. So did we, so we, we probably, this, this tool of getting people to, to, to write some sticky notes, if we were in an actual meeting situation, then I might, um, if we were on Zoom, you could, you know, show me your, your stickies or if we were using, stories on board or one of those tool tools um we we could could share it but otherwise you know you might i might invite you to just take a picture of the stickies on your wall send it to me and and you know then we would have sort of an array and we could say you know 35 people have said blah 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 and we have oh this really cool one so you really need to be sort of actively seeking input um or you can get just get people to say it depending on how how comfortable they are speaking with each other. But these are just different techniques that you can use. The next mm -hmm. one is make a list. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, one thing that also came from the uh, group was saying, just use the chat window in Zoom. Yeah. Yeah. The chat window in Zoom is awesome. But, you know, if you've got picture, if you've got each other, you can wave thing, you know, can wave signs at each other and, and things like that. But yeah, so so getting people just to put on sticky, get it, use the chat, use the question box, use whatever you have. If you don't have that, if all you have is phone, find, you know, some way that that you get people connecting. So another way you can do is just get people to make a list. So so some of the ways that um, that you can can look at analyzing the information is give some people people some of the information in advance uh, while the meeting is on you can a, a very low fidelity way is have people send in their thoughts by an email and then have somebody be checking the mail it's really hard for you to do this alone sometimes so you need just to, to invite someone to have a role in the meeting of the capturer of of stuff um it's it you know this <laughs> The ideal thing in agility is that we're all in one room. That's what the boys in Snowbird suggested and what, you know, the pure zealot agilists want. In the real world, especially if we're working in banks or insurance companies or telcos or people building, you know, anything in a big organization, we usually have remote teams or we have work from home teams. So the reality is that we have to figure it out and it isn't easy. Um, but, but there are ways to use your humans, your human communication skills to make that happen. Mm -hmm. You have uh, touched the nerve here because there's a lot of conversation going on. And I don't want you to feel like, um, the, like uh, you are talking and the rest of the team is not uh, paying attention, right? Those people that multitask. So <laughs> I wanted to, to check with you on, or, or let you know what's going on on the chat, on the question. Oh, are they throwing so, rocks and tomatoes at me? No, no, <laughs> they're, they're throwing ideas. So oh, good. is there some way to capture all that? They're <laughs> saying run departments meetings with lean coffee on Trello. Yeah. Um, uh, Mara is saying group similar ideas and, um, Valerie is asking if there's a minimum number of people in a distant meeting that would be like an optimum number. Mm, Peter, is yeah, asking, Peter, is, Peter is asking if there is post-it notes, how would you cluster them on a remote location? Like, will you rewrite them or cluster yeah, them in place? Yeah, um, I think helpful for that. How about cameras? Um, 
how about playing poker? <laughs> so yeah, there's a lot of things going on here to simulate silent brainstorming. Use Google yeah. Docs. So, so yeah, I yeah. don't know. I wanted to let you know what's going on here. That's right good now. because what, what we're doing is we're making people be creative here and getting them to think about the other ways to do it. Um, right. I'm I'm choosing because I don't want to be distracted not to look at the at the questions as they're coming in, um, and so it's sort of like doing a presentation in a closet. <laughs> but but um, yeah, so so the idea is for us to fire up our imaginations and look at the ways that we can do it. And so so um, you know we can the ways we how how we might decide um, using the question feature again was going to be to share some ways to decide. Um, you know, we can do thumb votes over over questions in chat. We can, we can, we can. A dot democracy would be a little bit harder to do. You might be able to do that through a Google Doc. Um, some of the things you can do also is get into a smaller group discussion. We might say we, and this addresses one of the questions that came up. Say we're twenty people on a call. We might say, okay, let's just break for. Uh, 10 minutes while we talk about this, you two pair up, you three pair up, you four pair up, whatever, and come back in however many minutes and we'll talk about what you discussed. Some tools like Moodle and Maestro conferencing allow you to stay on the line while you break into breakout rooms, but you can do it. Um, you can do it in other ways. I've been on full day planning sessions where we talk for 10 minutes and then we go off and do stuff on our own and then we come back or sometimes we we talk for 10 minutes and then we go off and we pair or or go into triads and then we come back and talk about what we've discussed. So there are many ways that you can you can kind of overcome this distance problem. So did we have any any ways to make a group decide come in? Um, there, I mean, all these ideas keep coming. Um, <laughs> and the, uh, I believe someone is saying, I believe with the modern day electronic boards like Kanban board, remote daily scrum are not an issue. Um, well, sometimes they are. That's the, that's the thing. You know, I, I was hearing, having a conversation this morning with somebody and I said, oh, I was looking at, um, at Mural today and, and how useful that would be. And they said, oh, yeah, I tried to do a test there, but, you know, it's not approved by our software police and their headquarters. You know, they're, they're, uh, they're an LY domain and so they might be in the Middle East and therefore, you know, who knows what's going on. I mean, there are just so many things in these big organizations that are impediments to like really good tools. It's sad. Mm -hmm. And I, I would say that as coaches and facilitators, it's probably a little bit our role to help them understand that better tools would really help. Right. But in the meantime, this is kind of the best we can do. And, you know, if you track how long and how much effort it is to do a meeting this way, to have it effective, um, it might be that that's a selling, a selling proposition for your group. <laughs> I just uh, I just want to give a heads up. We have about 15 minutes left. Yeah. Some ideas yeah. coming here yeah. are around multi voting and dot voting and storms. Other so other tools like storms. Uh, yeah. Just have conversations. Is, uh, is there a way to capture the uh, the chat, Ardita? Yes, there is. Good. Let's do that. Okay. So we'll move on to a big, huge rule, which is we really need to give people time to think because that's the whole point of having them together, right? And sometimes if we're facilitating, our feeling is that we have to have somebody talking all the time. And then our temptation as the facilitators often or even, or even as a participant is to fill the vacancy with our own jabbering. And it's really important to allow silence. And so a technique that I've learned um, is to say, let's take a minute to think about this. And sometimes I'll even set a timer for it, you know, two minutes or whatever, so that people know that this is about thinking and not talking, because it's really important to give them time to think. And uh, anybody who's who's been in any of my uh, coach courses knows I have this slogan, wait until it's uncomfortable and then count to 10. Because you really want to allow people to think. And another big rule 
is to give all voices a chance to be heard. They call this deep democracy. Um, there, we have to find ways to encourage and engage the quiet people. And some of these have already come up in the, in the questions. Uh, silent brainstorming for one, small group conversations. Um, something I've learned to say is, I'd love to hear from somebody who hasn't participated yet, or I'd love to hear from some of the people who haven't participated so much. What that does is it allows them to participate without me singling them out. Because if I say, well, I'd love to hear from Ardita, if Ardita has been dozing or hasn't got anything to say at this moment, um, then I've put her on the spot. But if I say I'd love to hear from somebody that, you know, that hasn't participated yet, that gives them the open door if they want to participate. We have to recognize that a lot of people need to think before they speak but a lot of other people don't know what they think until they hear what they say. So we're very different kinds of people, maybe in the same room. So the whole issue of trying to figure out ways to engage people is really important. And this will be super important if you're dealing with people whose first language is not English. So if we've got people working in Latin America or, or Ukraine or somewhere like that, make sure that you give them time to you know, sort this through in their own language and then find the person who speaks English well enough to, to state it. Um, because there's often a reason that they're not participating. It may be around language. Um, you also can help by giving people the notice of the order that you'll want to hear from them in. That way they do know that they are expected to participate and they will know when. And if you know who the quiet people are, don't make them go first. Um, how do we keep pe noisy people from dominating exactly the same way? Because if I say I'd love to hear from somebody who hasn't participated much, noisy person knows that's not her, usually. And it doesn't embarrass them at all. It just, um, unless you stare right at them, which they can't see because you're remote. Um, Something else that's important, and I saw this at Menlo Innovations when I went to visit them uh, last year, they have, when, when they have a lot of people or anybody on a remote call, they have these big teddy bears that they sit at the table um, when there's some people all together and others who, who are remote, and that way they're not forgotten, right? We know that they're there and they, you know, the teddy bear is sitting there and it has their name on it so that we remember to include them on the voice call. Um, and that's kind of where we are with that. Did anybody have any sort of better ideas or other ideas? Anything amazing come in through the chat? Not at this one. <laughs> okay. So now we got to close the darn meeting. We finally have more worked our way through, you know, gathering the data. We've involved people. They've talked about their insights. They've figured out what it is. We have to close the meeting. Um, first thing to do, plow the parking lot. Figure out all of the things that you captured that were not relevant to the meeting. You want to make sure that, you know, people are handling those or we've decided they don't really need to be talked about or something has to happen, but you don't want to leave these things hanging because they will come back to haunt you in another meeting. Um, capture the decisions and let people know what's going to happen to them and then make that happen. And it doesn't have to be you necessarily, but you know, in the old days we used to take minutes. Um, this is the sort of thing like we've decided, blah, 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 take a picture of the decision, send it to whoever, make sure it happens. And then thank everybody for coming. Um, because that's important their time is is valuable and if you can end early you give them the gift of time and and that's uh that's pretty cool um skills of facilitators take a look at this see if you're all in the got it column or if you need a little bit more you will gain these through practice and sometimes through pairing with somebody who can coach you or pairing with a more experienced facilitator is often really useful too. And then for virtual, you have to understand the tech. Um, I, there's a handout that will probably come after the class uh, is over that has this list on it that you can kind of be, you know, check yourself ag against and just sort of see where you, where you sit. And, um, 
I promised you some references. These are particularly good. Ingrid Benz's book is large and not inexpensive, but it's got everything you might ever want to know about facilitating meetings of any kind, particularly trainings. Um, Jennifer Britton, who's uh, a woman who lives just north of Toronto, she's um, she specializes in team coaching, primarily um, you know, she's not an agile coach, but she, she specializes in team coaching. She's written a bunch of books and I've taken some classes with her. This is her new book and it's it's full of great ideas. Dorothy Strachan, um, that's how she pronounces it, um, has written a good book. It's an old book, Making Questions Work. Very good. And then, of course, uh, the queens of the retrospectives, Esther and Diana, have um, have created everything you might possibly want to know about running a retrospective. And so these are important um, books for us to know as agilists. There may be others um, that you know that are valuable. I have probably got 16 facilitation books, but these are the ones that I are my go-to books. And I'm kind of, if you want to find me, this is how and where. And that's all I have. So we have like five minutes to do questions if we need them. We do, and we have questions. Um, okay. So first of all, there is someone that cannot find the questions box, which is a great example oh. of how one tool works for some and doesn't work for some others. And um, I am chatting with uh with that person on the side and telling hey please put this question on the question box so it, it's amazing how tools sometimes are confusing yeah um, so if you're going to be if you're going to be doing something like this it's quite often at the beginning of the thing just to have everybody try it there's a feature where you can put up your hand right i can yeah. see that i'm going to put my hand up right now and <laughs> you know, there we so, go yeah so we have some questions that uh, have been waiting and people have been waiting patiently. So maybe we can go quickly through them, like a minute for each. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, one is about um, what is a good tool about the parking lot? How to manage the parking lot? Okay, um, I as the as the facilitator, I would say. Uh, does that feel that it's relevant to this particular issue or shall we capture that and deal with it some other time and so then you'll just make a parking lot and again you could put that in chat or you could just keep notes as you're going and then and then refer to them as you close you know we've got this do we still need to talk about it who wants to take that on um so that's kind of parking lot mm -hmm. my view of parking lot yeah uh another question is would a facilitator not give a group to two or three options to choose from as a way of converging? Ah, well, you could do that in the moment, say, would you like to do this or would you like to do that or would you like to do this? It makes sense to me to have a plan, but you know, you could, again, you read your audience based on how you know them and you know the first time that you do it um you'll get a sense of what the people are like in your second or third team meetings you'll have a sense that this these guys like to make their own decisions so let's you know give them four options and let them choose other people like to be told what to do so let's give them one and ask them to do it and then the next meeting you might say hey you know we've been doing this for a while let's try something different again it's about reading the people but yeah, the idea of giving them options of how, what what that will do is take time though while they jabber, jabber about it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, <laughs> the next one, if there's a conflict of ideas, what should uh, we do? That's another whole webinar. <laughs> but another I, webinar? <laughs> I would say this is another whole webinar on, on conflict. But um, the best thing to do is, is pull them down from their angry positions back to what is true, what is the fact here. Um, another clue in this one is sometimes to figure out what's the unmet need here. Um, sometimes they're just not getting something and you have to rack your brain to figure out what it is. It's often they're not getting airtime or they're not feeling respected. Mm -hmm. Um, um, you thoughts on that one, Ardita? No. no. <laughs> okay. There are some more questions. I, I, I thought we're. Can I continue with another question or? Uh, go, go. Okay. Um, someone is saying we don't have tools. However, we can be on the phone call and 
uh, someone is writing on the whiteboard, what do you do in that case when you're on the phone and someone is writing on the board? Read out what they're writing <laughs> or take a photograph of it and send them an email. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Peter is asking, what's the lowest tech way that you have facilitated or brainstorming a session with remote participants? So pictures of post-it notes or lists? Uh, the best low tech way I've ever done it um, I'm just thinking about it. Really, we all kind of made our own list. Um, and then one at a time, we talked about, you know, one or two and then started adding to, you know, you, you start to see a pattern. Um, yes, I had that too. Yes, I had that too. And, and yeah, if, if, if all you've got is phone, you know, you've got to talk about what is written, but, um, yeah, most of the things that I've used lately have had some form of chat. Um, but you know, if all you have is a conference call, then we have to figure something out. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. I would say that reading out of the lists or the stickies and, and just kind of, you know, keeping track of how many times this particular point comes up and then we know it's the big one. Okay. Uh, Steve you want to limit it to five things. You don't want to get people, you know, with a list of 35 things. That's going to take a long time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, there is a question that I'm trying to validate here about uh, 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 is it a better is it better to have a facilitator other than the trainer or presenter for remote session? Is it a must, a one to five uh, ratio? Again, you know, if we were talking about an ideal world, we would be able to have somebody else do the facilitation and focus totally on the process. Um, and then we would be free as the manager or the scrum master or the whoever's running the meeting to actually participate in the meeting. Um, that's the ideal. And that's kind of what we recommend in all, all kinds of facilitation situations. But um, the real news is that that doesn't happen very often. So what I might do then is to say, you know, Ardita, could you take over facilitation right now for a while while I share my views? So I'm going to take off my facilitator hat and give it to you. And then I can share my views. But uh, yeah, ideally, ideally you have somebody else who all they're doing is facilitation and they don't have to worry about anything else. It's about the process and making it solid and keeping the time and all of that. I guess that's most of the questions. We we kind of have covered them. Uh, there is a long list of suggestions about tools that people have put there, so probably we can share those later, as you suggested. Right. And um, I think um, I'm going to take probably at this point the presentation to close. But thank you so much. Um, you have definitely. Um, uh, I have pulled the attention of a lot of people and you have uh, uh, people talking about it during during this uh, session. So I think you definitely hit the nerve in a lot of things that people are trying to improve on their uh, meetings and at work. There's no simple answer. It's about unleash your creativity and your humanity. And that's kind of what we're talking about when we're talking about Agile anyway, right? Yeah. And so thank you, Sue. This was a really good webinar and the uh, recording is going to be available soon. In a couple of days, you will get the email. On behalf of Toronto Agile community, thank you for attending. Thank you for participating. And thank you for uh, being part of this webinar. Mm -hmm. um, I want to uh, tell everyone that we are organizing the open space. The Agile open space is coming soon. Um, so stay tuned. Uh, if you are not um, part of our list, please do subscribe to our newsletter or follow us on Twitter for the news. And uh, like this, you're never going to miss another event that is coming from us. With that in mind, thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful day.